indeed a very special day. So good, good morning to everyone. Uh, as Farad said, today is indeed Gandhiji's birthday and also my father's birthday. But it's also Tarun's mother's birthday. Uh, and it's also uh, Kiran Pasricha, who's the CEO of the Ananta and Ananta Aspen Center, and who I think is also on the call. Uh, it's also her birthday. So happy birthday, Kiran. Um, we, we, as Farad said, like to begin new great things for the organization on this day. Uh, and when we decided to, do, to start a lecture series, um, our first choice was Tarun Das. Uh, Tarun is a really unique individual. Um, I've described him a couple of times. I've said that, you know, after Jawaharlal Nehru, he is India's greatest builder of institutions. But the difference with Jawaharlal Nehru is that uh, people don't know about what Tarun has really done through his career and his life. Um, there'll be more on CI later, but Tarun has established, uh, he's brought the Aspen Center to India and established the Ananta and Ananta Aspen Centers here. Uh, he played the key role in getting uh, the Bharati Yuva Shakti Trust off the ground in India, uh, the India at 75 Foundation, uh, the Council on Energy, Environment and Water, uh, the Sasegawa Le Leprosy Foundation. Uh, he's contributing fundamentally to the success of one of our finest research institutions at the Institute of Economic Growth. And these are only the institutions that I know of. Uh, so really a, a fundamental contribution to building uh, the kind of country that we all want to live in. But the institution that will always, I think, be Tarun's legacy is CII. Um, both Farad and I, uh, and many others on this call, have participated in CI in, uh, uh, in many, many forums, uh, you know, when Mali, Milan, uh, many of us, in fact, many of us, I mean, we have, we've, we've made wonderful friends uh, like Ben Mali through CI and thanks to CI. Uh, Jamshid, uh, you know, uh, we got to know the Godrich family and to, to know Jamshid through CI. Uh, and these have been some of our greatest pleasures uh, in life. And we share, I think, between Forbes Marshall and CI, um, we share values, we share aspirations for India and the world. Uh, we share aspirations for India's place in the world. Uh, we even have a similar size in terms of number of people, uh, similar cultures of caring for people. Um, many CI people's best friends are other people working in CI uh, throughout their lives. Uh, it's the same at Forbes Marshall. Um, and I think what has always been most impressive to us in Farad's and my interaction with CI is the people within CI, the dedication they bring to their roles, the dedication to the country, the commitment to the country, uh, and the sheer niceness that often sheer niceness doesn't go with, uh, with great capability, but in the case of everyone at CI and the CI Secretariat it does. So that's always made Farad and me really comfortable in CI and uh, um, it's why we wanted to explore this subject with Tarun today. Um, you know, uh, about, about nine months ago, we articulated a company purpose and we articulated our purpose as energizing businesses and communities worldwide. And that purpose uh, says that our ambition is to deliver benefits to our customers, uh, that we wish to deliver these benefits to customers worldwide, uh, as we do in India, but at present in another 20 countries. But over the, over the decades, uh, the ambition is to do it to customers worldwide in every country. And over time, we also want to energize communities worldwide. Uh, we feel we contribute and make a difference uh, around us in, in Pune, 
Um, but our ambition is that every community in which we operate should be better in however small a way uh, because we're there. So that's the ambition. Uh, and it seems, uh, the ambition seems audacious. Uh, but the ambition pales next to the ambition and purpose of CI. Because CI's purpose is national development. CI's purpose is uh, the development of the country. And that means 1.3 billion people. And how can one institution, um, however capable, have such, a, such an almost audacious ambition? You know, when Chandraji became Director General of uh, CI uh, in the late 2000s, uh, he, in one of our discussions, he says, you know, well, CI is a development institution. Um, and I remember my reaction at the time was, uh, no, 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 that can't be right. We're not the government of India. And I can only say that at the end of getting closer and closer into CI, and uh, especially uh, in my year as president, at the end of that year, I wasn't, sure, wasn't so sure that in CI, we weren't the government of India. Uh, we really, I think, in CI have that ambition. And I want to sort of end with reading two sentences from uh, Tarun's book, uh, Crossing Frontiers, which is about uh, the journey that he had with CI for 46 years. He says, CI's potential to contribute to India's development and growth is truly limitless because business and industry, when it rises above itself, as it did in CI, can and did contribute to national development. Where else can one find an organized, thinking, intelligent, resourceful, nation-oriented institution such as this? And it's absolutely true. Um, there is no parallel to CI. It's not just that CI is the best industry association in the world. There is no association that comes anywhere close in terms of the scope of its work uh, and in terms of the purpose for why it exists. Um, and the person who set the base for that and the person who created the culture that makes this happen uh, is Tarun. So Tarun, we are really delighted to have you with us today. Uh, we are honored that you will provide us with your insights uh, not only on your journey with CI, um, but especially on how you went about building this, this fantastic culture within CI, because the legacy lives on. Um, it's gone from strength to strength uh, with Chandrajit. And that legacy, that culture, that foundation that you built uh, is so critical to us as a country, but it's so I think worthwhile for all of us in our organizations to learn from as we try to ourselves uh, achieve things that are ambitious and great. So Chandrajit, maybe, uh, Tarun, maybe I can ask, start by asking you, um, you know, if you could start maybe by talking some about your journey to give people who aren't so familiar with the CI story some indication of the background, and then we can get more and more into a discussion on, uh, on uh, uh, the culture that you've built in CI. Thank you. Over to you, Tarun. Thank you, Naushad. Thank you very much. It's a very special honor to, to be part of this Founders Day program. And I want to begin by adding my own happy birthday wishes to your father, to Mr. Darius Forbes. And I'm particularly honored that he is listening in and maybe watching. So that's, that's really great. Um, I've read his book, uh, Business with a Difference, Bicycles, Boilers, Belief. It's an amazing true story of a great man, a founder and the builder of Forbes Marshall. And I was particularly struck 
by something that Rhea says in the book. She says that Forbes Marshall pervades our family, our home. And she goes on to say that our grandparents nurtured the company like a child, embedded their personal values in Forbes Marshall. And Darius Jr., when he was uh, working with you, Rati, uh, on a CSR project, had gone to a village and he found there, and he speaks of this, he found the respect, affection and reverence for his grandfather, which the people there were transferring on to him. What an amazing story and what an amazing person uh, who founded Forbes Marshall. So he truly is a role model extraordinary and I'm deeply honored to, to be here with you today. Uh, for me, Forbes Marshall, the company as a whole, beyond the Forbes family, is a family. And uh, I find a very deep, strong, wonderful culture in Forbes Marshall. And in a way, we tried to build, without knowing it at that time, a family culture in CII. So we were born out of a very strange marriage between the uh, a British heritage on the one side and a Marwari heritage on the other side. And uh, neither of whom wanted much to do with us. We almost felt as if we were the illegitimate child, or unwelcome child who had been born in April 1974. So what, what drove us, and I will cover seven issues, but I will spend more time on one in particular. The first issue was that we will be different. And I won't expand on that. We will be different because the country was dominated by two major chambers of commerce who worked for industry, who were influential, who were powerful. Um, but we wanted to be different. And when we were born, the first thing we said, we want to be different. What we, we didn't know at that time how, but uh, that was, very, very central in our thinking. And the second is, and this is where I will spend a little more time, but the people and the staff in the organization are central to our role, our work, our performance. And they will be drivers. They will not be bag carriers. If you go back in those days, secretariats were essentially bag carriers. They were instructed what to do. We wanted to be different. We would do every job that needed to be done, however humble, however seemingly lowly. For example, in February 1975, the staff of CII swept the halls of Pragati Maidan all through the night so that it would be clean for the inaugural ceremony of our first trade fair, the first engineering trade fair. We didn't have enough resources to employ enough sweepers. So we worked all night. We went home at six in the morning and we were back changed and ready, suited and booted by 8.30. Third, we felt everyone can grow. And the CII story is of people 
joining at the very base, but growing and evolving and taking up senior positions. So there was not a class distinction. Anybody could grow. And if you look at the history of CII staff, you'll find many people grew from the bottom up. Fourth, you trust the young. I was 35. By and large, barring one or two exceptions, everybody was in their late 20s or early 30s. And we found that trusting the young, inexperienced, but energetic, enthusiastic, excited, was something we would work and invest in. And that paid and that really gave great returns. We believed in rotation of jobs. We felt and we found that people grew, people evolved when they did different jobs. Different experiences rounded them off, matured them, made them more effective. And so uh, you've talked about Chandrajit, uh, God knows how many jobs he changed and how many times he moved uh, with great uh, pain and discomfort, but it was part of the process in CII. We were respectful to members and office bearers, but we would be independent. Um, on my first day in Delhi, 9th of November, 74, I got an instruction that the then vice president wanted to see me at nine in the morning at his house and uh, that I should be at his home every morning at nine to report to him. I didn't go. There was a commotion about it, but we sorted ourselves out. And as you know, I stayed and he, he became the president also, and we worked very well together. We abolished buzzers and bells in the office. And, and there's, a, there, there's a reference, there's a connect here with Forbes Marshall and what your father used to do, Naushad. We all carried our own papers. There was no, we did not believe in the peon culture that they will be sitting, somebody sitting outside the door to come in and carry papers when we rang the bell. There were no bells in AII and there were no bells in CII. We walked around to connect with each other and did our work wherever staff were sitting. We went to the workplaces of staff. We did not call them to our office. And in the offices, the senior people who had offices, we had a system where there was a workstation against the wall and a small round table. And we, whenever we sat together, the staff or anybody, we sit around the round, round table. There was no difference and there was no barrier of a desk between any of us. There was, we were sitting side by side, always around around the table. The doors were kept open. Those who had rooms, the doors were kept open. People could walk in whenever, unless there's a meeting going on. And that was a wonderful way of connecting with each other. Discipline was very important. Self-discipline, top-down discipline was very important. By just digress to say, if we had discipline in the country, I think we would sort out more than 50% of our problems. We had to have values of our own. We didn't have resources, financial resources. We were to start with only 30 staff in, in the organization. And uh, when we built our central office in Lodi Road, institutional area. We could not pay the bribe 
one we didn't have the money and second we didn't want to pay the bribe to get the electricity connection so for two years and two summers 1987 to 1989 we occupied that building without it was it's a building meant for air conditioning beautiful building by jacob allenstein great architect great american architect but it was built not for fans but for air conditioning so we survived two years until the electricity authority of delhi realized that they were not going to get any money from us and they gave us our connection after the summer of 1989 passion was very important to us passion motivation emotion heart was very important with each other and also connecting with members and co connecting with office bearers and uh, we tried to create a feeling that we care for each other we tried to create an atmosphere of caring and of a family the forbes marshall family the cii family these were some of the ways in which we tried to create a different kind of culture within cii yes we dreamt we dreamt and we aspired and those are bad days to dream those were nightmare days it was 1975 end of 74 i came to delhi 75 the prime minister declared emergency very bad days but we dreamt we dreamt of a better india and we dreamt of doing things for india with india beyond india uh, we didn't stop dreaming and we said and i say it now even this time will pass because we will go through bad times but this time will pass and that that is something i believe in deeply so we we the culture was that we must paint on a white canvas and we will paint with water colors and we will paint with oils and we will paint with pencils but we will paint on a white canvas and we will continue to extend the canvas as as we go forward we were clear that there must be deep synergy with office bearers presidents are there for one year we get attached to them they get attached to us they move on after the agm and the next morning is a new president and we have to work with him different style different culture different background but the same quality of service the same quality of support must be given to each president and that has been the culture of cii always it's been difficult sometimes not been easy but we have tried always to be true to that spirit of working closely with presidents day in and day out we had to earn trust and we realized that building trust is not through words building trust is through actions so our actions of the secretariat had to be such that we would every day we would build trust we would earn trust from the government we will earn trust from industry we will earn trust from the international community we will earn trust from trade unions and we will go on every day adding to that bank of trust and the day that we lose trust we realize it will take a very long time to rebuild that trust we struggled for 10 years november 74 to 1984 very tough times i think the struggle was good in in building in starting from bottom from base camp as it were the struggle was very important uh, to hone character to build character to build the institution uh, nothing should come too easily 
life is full of ups and downs institutions have their ups and downs and uh, the 10 years of intense struggle when one had to phone members at the end of the month to say will you send your subscription so that we can pay salaries i mean that kind of struggle i mean that's only one example was very important and and there were still those two big chambers of commerce dominating delhi and dominating india and it took us those 10 years to come into the sunshine as it were sunshine of respect sunshine of recognition and uh, the sunshine of being trusted by the policy makers by industry leaders and one of the things in, when we talk about industry leaders all the older people were in either of the two chambers so we went for the younger generation we went for the sons and nephews to come into aii and cii and that worked beautifully young secretariat young presidents young office bearers there was a much better connect uh, that way and yet through them and through their families we had a connect uh, informally into the other so when you're building culture now sure it's not about high tech it's just getting the little things right and uh, applying common sense using your head uh, using your heart especially your heart so that's a very long answer to your question but culture is everything and culture makes people it changes people and this culture helped us to bring about change in india from outside government had no power cii has no power but we were able to bring about change because we created a culture of trust of respect and I think that really built the institution into a very strong place. And as you say, you say the chief custodian of CII culture today is also with us, Chandrajit, and I'm sure he is working day in and day out in a much more difficult environment than I worked to sustain that culture. I'll stop now. Thank you, thank you, Tarun. That was uh, that was that was terrific. I, you know, one of the things that's striking about the way CI operates, and you you referred to this when you talked about that the secretariat would not be bag carriers, that the secretariat would drive the organization. But not only does the secretariat drive the organization, but it does so in a very interesting way, which is that the visibility and the publicity and the credit goes to the office bearers. You know, the speeches are given by the office bearers. Uh, you know, Chandruji spent uh, most of my year as president uh, making me look good as president. Um, you know, making sure that uh, if there was X, Y, Z that I was going to say, that it was improved and sharpened. Um, you know, making sure that I was in just the right events in just the right way. Um, and he does this with every president. Um, and uh, the same is true of the regional directors with the regional chair pe people and the state uh, heads with the state chairs. Um, so it's true across the organization. Um, and this combination of sort of driving the agenda and driving the organization um, while not being visible uh, by doing it, you know, from behind the scenes makes for a very unique combination. And I wonder if you could talk a little about, about that because you must have wrestled with, you know, people in, in CI who were very capable, but who wanted to be in the limelight, um, uh, you know, and uh, not just be in uh, the background. Um, it takes a, did you have to select them in or did you, uh, did they learn as they went along? <laughs> um, you know, Naushad, the, we had to think through this a great deal because 
everyone has ego. Mm. And the secretariat is not, or CII secretariat or any secretariat is not uh, exempt from that ego problem. But we decided collectively that we are in the solutions business. And we've always looked at our work. Just don't pass the buck. Don't bring your problems. Bring the solution. And one of the biggest solutions that we had to find was here is a president coming for one year. He's giving his time. You know, many presidents gave up their company work for a full year when they became president. They spend their own money. They spend much more money for various things, not only travel, but entertainment and so many other things. What do they get out of it? So when we were discussing this and we were thinking about it, and we came to the solution that they must get profile. They must get profile. And there was a saying in the government. I remember after the, after one of our presidents who was not well known, uh, the government secretary said, how does a CII president who we didn't know one year ago become a national figure one year later? You know, so that, that, that was our machine. And that was our culture that we owed it to the president because he was doing a year of public service. All presidents have not fully understood this, especially some of the recent ones. But in my time, every president understood that they were in a year of public service. Some more so, some a little less so, but uh, they were doing public service. And we were not going to be, we may be sitting on the dais next to him, but we would be giving him notes of what to say. In 30 years of the National Council meeting between 74 and 2004, Naushad, I never spoke. I spoke through the president. I never spoke. It's not my place. That's your place. That's your day. I'm day. My day is there all through the year to work, to deliver, to interact with government, to the media, can do all of that. But your day has to be preserved, has to be precious, and we in the Secretariat must make it so. And you, at the end of the day, as our principal customer for that year, internal customer, must go out at the end of the year feeling really good that we looked after you, that we cared for you, you are the head of our family, and you will, when you step out of the presidency, you will be in love with us for life. So, you know, Tarun, when, when, uh, when, I, read, when I read your book, you know, I gave you some feedback, and I said I, I enjoyed both the books you wrote, and you said I only wrote one book, and I said, well, you know, I really enjoyed uh, both the book you wrote and the book you didn't because uh, Tarun's book is, you know, each chapter is on a different precedent, except that it's not. If you read the book, um, you have to read it. Everyone should read it twice because you read it once and, you know, you read it and understand the book. And then you read it the second time and you'll see that in some chapters, it's all about what the precedent did. And in other chapters, it's all about what happened in that year when so-and-so happened to be president. <laughs> uh, and so without, without saying so, you know, you could tell who the, who the presidents were who did something uh, and the presidents who were who didn't. <laughs> so, but that's, 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 those, are, those are my words, not, not your story. <laughs> so, uh, I, have a, I, have a, I have a 
question also on, you know, one of the things that's striking about the CIA secretary um, is the prominence and leadership uh, of women. By the way, I, uh, logistics point, uh, you know, we really encourage questions to come in. And if you put the questions on the chat or in the Q&A box, uh, then Chaya will pick them up and coordinate them and uh, send them over so that uh, uh, we can ask them. Uh, so please do ask, please do ask questions. Uh, and uh, those of you who are on uh, uh, the, the panel, you can of course ask them in person. Yeah? So let me ask one more question then I'm going to uh, uh, go to Ria for a question and then uh, we'll move on. Hmm? Uh, you know that one of the things that's striking about the CIA Secretariat is, the, uh, is, the, is that it's, it has a lot of uh, really capable leadership positions filled by women. And this was very early on, uh, you know, at a time when it was very uncommon in the world, let alone in India. Um, you know, and uh, I mean, both Farad and I got involved in CI. Farad, Milan, I, all three of us got involved in CI thanks to Chaya, who's, uh, you know, on this, uh, on this panel. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, Sandhya, Sarita, Nirja, Charu, Tanushri, Amita, it's full of powerful, it's, you know, CI is full of powerful women. I mean, you know, I, I once said it could almost be like a Parsi family. You know, and it's, uh, it's uh, or a Bengali family, maybe, you know, it's, uh, uh, how did, did you do that? Was that something that you consciously set out to do? Or did it just sort of happen? Well, we were uh, essentially an all male organization to start with. And then we started recruiting women. Uh, essentially, they were recruited as assistants or as secretaries. And then as we evolved and grew, you know, I made the point that we believe that everybody can grow. And so we realized very quickly that the women were very good at this kind of work. We were, we were essentially a service industry and uh, actually women were better than men at this kind of work. Uh, their commitment, uh, their ability to connect with people, their EQ, uh, all of that. So when uh, opportunities started coming up, I started suggesting that uh, women should be sent out to be heads of overseas offices. Uh, there was huge reaction to that initially. I said, no, oh, no, no, she's not an economics graduate. How can she, you know, be sent out? Or uh, you're being cruel. She is a single girl. How can she go and live in a foreign country alone? Uh, I remember that in one case. You know, and these women perform so well I mean, ambassadors and high commissioners abroad had so much confidence in these women executives who headed our offices abroad that they did not function on the economic and business side without consulting these young women who were representing CII at that time. So, step by step, we found that you know, they were successful, so they could go as regional directors, as heads of state offices, heads of divisions in CII. And uh, eventually, I think we landed up, by the time I retired, with almost a 50-50 ratio of men and women. And it was great. Women brought great quality to, to CII. I didn't mention it um, in my opening remarks because I thought you might, you know, pick it up later and they really are outstanding. And uh, any organization which wants to do its best must have a very, very strong ratio of women to men because they add a different perception. They add different value. And uh, they are, they're worth their weight in gold. You know, I can, uh, I can only say that when uh, 
we we for example you know i'm i'm a trustee on some of the institutions that tarun has created and whenever we talk about new members of the board uh tarun will always remind us uh you know that let's look around let's look more widely <laughs> and uh i think that's a that's a very important uh, a very important message for us all um let me go to ria would you like to ask a question so sure. um so many questions but maybe let's start with this one um when you talked a lot about heart you know the importance of using your heart um and one thing that's always struck me in our conversations is that you um are incredibly willing to be authentic and to be vulnerable um more so than uh, a lot of a lot of people in sort of more formal contexts and i'm curious how do you think about bringing that kind of authenticity and heart into professional contexts which are often governed much more by um the head i don't know that's the way i am i feel i feel i i'm emotional i um uh, i i see somebody he or she has a problem uh, there used to be a somewhat of an unkind joke in cii when i was there uh, that my room uh, you know the the room has no carpet it's a chatai indian material uh, but there's an invisible layer of water which you cannot see and those are the tears of the staff who cried in that room uh, with all their problems and uh, and i don't know why people felt comfortable uh, sharing their very personal problems uh, there are at least four women executives who had deep personal problems uh, which they shared uh, i arranged for each one of them to have professional counseling um, cii paid for it but the invoice which would come from the psychologist or psychiatrist would not have the name of the person so that we would only i knew the name of the person and i would authorize approve the payment so i think uh, i don't know maybe i'm an only child uh, very sensitive uh, initially very sensitive to myself i think later much more sensitive to others so um, and i'm i like listening i was a very poor communicator this job taught me to communicate but uh, i was a good listener to people maybe that helps i don't know I don't know whether I'm answering you properly, but I'm answering you honestly. Thanks, sir. Re, re, re. You want to, you want to do a follow up? Maybe on a different. Yeah. Topic. Um. So going back to your point about trusting young people, um, that's always struck me because in the context in which many of these young people were working at CII. they must have been interacting constantly with people who were much older and much more experienced than them um so how did you equip them to be successful in those situations to go in with confidence to be able to use their energy to be you know to be their full potential in those contexts just make them feel that i believe in them just make them feel that i believe in them they can do it and uh, one of my most radical decisions early on was to send a 25 year old man to become the regional director in in madras at that time um we always had a tambram you know in madras so when i announced that you know we were sending somebody from the north to be the regional director in the south 
there was a revolt amongst our membership. There was a revolt amongst our staff. But three years later, when I moved this guy from there to go and handle the Bengalis in Calcutta, who are much more difficult to handle, um, the South was crying. They said, don't take him away. So you make the person believe you can do it. Anybody can do anything. Ordinary people can do extraordinary things. Actually, who's extraordinary? We're all ordinary people. But we can, each one of us can do extraordinary things, Ria. Given the opportunity, given the space, and given the trust. Thank you. You know, uh, Tarun, I think your, your, your responses are so authentic and uh, so meaningful uh, for us all. You know, the, there, there are a few, there are quite a few questions coming in. Now I have to, uh, <laughs> some of them, some of them, you know, are, are almost better, better answered by Chandraji, uh, <laughs> but we won't put him on the spot. <laughs> um, you know, it says, so there's a question here which says, uh, you know, sometimes it is observed that the government ignores the suggestions given by CIA. How do you deal with such situations? <laughs> Oh, that that's an age-old problem. Yeah, that's nothing new. So and that's an age-old old. problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, we don't necessarily see the full picture from outside government. We can't. We can't. Uh, and they have to balance many things. So whichever government it is. So I look back to the '90s and the '80s. This this problem will never change. Very much. I mean, yeah, that was very much my, you know, the, I mean, my own, my own take on it was that, was that the government not taking up a good suggestion was never a reason not to have a good suggestion available. Yeah. Um, and because uh, the way in which uh, reform in a sense happens in the country is sort of accidental. It's not that systematic and logical, you know, that if we are prepared and then our preparation um, happens to combine with the right minister and the right secretariat, the right secretary uh, in the government department, something happens. Um, but you know, if you have the right minister and the right secretariat, a uh, right secretary, and you're not prepared <laughs> with what should be done, then you've lost that opportunity. So, I mean, that was always, that was, I know, always my take, but you have to just live with live with the, <laughs> the, the, the good ideas not being taken up. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go to Milan next. Milan, you can ask, I think you, if you unmute, you can ask your question in person, actually. Yeah, Th thanks very much, Nasha. Um, I wanted, you, you spoke about, about um, culture being everything um, in an organization, and, and Nasha um, very nicely described a lot, lots of the good um, aspects of, of CIS culture. Uh, which I think is is what makes so many of us so comfortable with CI, and we've been members for most of our careers. Um, you know, the openness, the um, the secretariat being uh, people of substance who drive the agenda, not being obsequious, um, uh, culture of excellence, um, the whole quality agenda for the country that really was was driven by CI. So all those things are are great, uh, but the the aspect that I find um, most uh, unique to CII uh, is the is the culture of integrity, uh, driving the integrity agenda uh, in in our country, where where it's it's uh, sadly um, there are very few institutions that do drive that sort of agenda. So I wanted to know how that came about because um, was it something that the that the uh, secretariat uh, uh, pushed or was it from the members? You know, I mean, a lot of our um, uh, members are, are very well known for this, uh, uh, unusually. I mean, like, like the Godridges, Forbes, Marshall, Infosys, uh, uh, Tata's. Um, uh, they, 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 they are unusual companies really in, in the Indian context. So did it come from the secretariat or from the members? I think it came uh, very much from the members. And, uh, and the secretariat was, of course, very comfortable with that, because then you're not being asked to do quote unquote wrong things, Milon. Um, 
you know, think back to my time, my executive board was, uh, you mentioned Jamshed, uh, Ratan Tata, uh, Rahul Bajaj, um, Suresh Krishna, you know, amazing people. These are amazing people who were there. So there was a strong underpinning of integrity in the boardroom, in the leadership, and this just meshed beautifully with us because we were not being asked to go and pay somebody to get some work done. You know, uh, these are not people who function like that. They disagreed with each other on many things, um, on policies, on reforms and all of that, but on values and on integrity, uh, there was absolutely no difference. So it was, a, it was a joint, very strong joint thing. And we had wonderful people in the board to, to make sure that we stayed on course. There were some people, you know, who would come sometimes and try to pull this way or that way, but uh, the ship, the ship stayed on course. Yeah. Thank you. Know, one of the uh, comments I'd make is that, you know, you go around any CI, you know, you mentioned Pragati Maidan, Maidan in 1975, you know, sweeping Pragati Maidan, which is not a small place to sweep. Um, and, but you, you know, even you know, in, in today, I mean, you know, you go to um, the partnership summit, which is happening in in Vizag, in a in a facility that has been built, a temporary facility built just for that purpose, um, or you go to uh, any CI office, whether in uh, uh, in in Gurgaon or in even Gauhati, um, and. The office will be spotless. It will be nicely maintained. Um, uh, you use a toilet in one of these temporary facilities where, you know, an exhibition center has been set up out of nowhere on the ground in Vizag um, and uh, where nothing existed. I mean, it was a dusty field uh, two weeks before. Um, and you'll have clean toilets. Uh, I mean, it's remarkable. Uh, I don't know any other, you know, you'd have, you'd have fresh towels and soap available. Uh, I mean, it's incredible. And I think that's a culture that it's widespread. It's right across the organization. Um, how, was this something that just came naturally or did you, did you inspect it in, into people? I mean, it, you know, I think it's, it's because it persists to this day. It's remarkable. There, there's a history to this. Uh, when we were, uh started our trade fairs in Pragati Maidan. Pragati Maidan was essentially used by all kinds of people as a public toilet. Mm. And we had to organize trade fairs in that environment. And we had to, of course, employ special sanitation sweepers to clean that part of it up. So we always we always determined that we when we have our own structure or any anything that we do, the toilets are going to be very clean and very well maintained. So that came, you know, it was deep in our psyche that we will always have clean toilets, and I think that stayed. Yeah, yeah, it's you know that's it's a, that's an aspect of culture. It's not an aspect of anything else. Um, you know, it's. Um, I, you know, I made the I made the observation to Chandrajit after we, you know, when we used to, you'd do the rounds of North Block and South Block, and to me it was always remarkable that South Block, you know, where the uh, where the Defense Ministry and the Foreign Minister, well, at that time, but the Defense Ministry is and the PMO is built identical mirror image buildings as the, as 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 North Block where the Finance Ministry is. But South Block is better maintained. It's incredible, um, uh, you know. The uh, and I've never been able to figure out why. And you know, it's uh, and I think it's because the people who actually 
are in there. Yeah. People in the defense ministry are more conscious of, um, of uh, their surroundings and care more about them than the finance ministry officials. Uh, Absolutely. There's yeah. a foreign ministry is also there, MEA. Yeah. They're all used to much higher standards. Yeah. Yeah. And I think so. It's a matter of, you know, really raising those standards and then um, uh, things just uh, sustain in a, in a, yeah. in a um, you know, there's a there's a there's a there's a question on um, sorry on my on my chat from Chaya, uh, which says, "What needs to be done to make India a business friendly country? Can the common citizen do anything about it?" Well, the most important thing is to trust the prime because uh, since the time of Nehru, who you lauded as being the best institutional builder. Um, the country has operated on a system of mistrust of the private sector and has actually encouraged people to find ways around the rules and regulations. And the rules and regulations have become more and more complex and actually cannot be administered. So the much better way is clean it all up abolish a whole lot of regulations, trust the private sector because you don't have any other. This is your army for development. This is your army for economic development. There's no other army. You don't have an option. The public sector is not going to make it because the public sector is run by politicians. So you have to allow the private sector space and let them be free. Just as you trust young people, take a risk on the private sector and they will perform. That would be my one single point answer. And I know that private sector has faults, but I say with all thy faults, I love thee still. Yeah. Yeah. The, there's a, there's a, a nice question about it says India is a young country. Uh, sorry, let me let me go let me go next to Vipin uh, and uh, Vipin uh, Vipin Sondi. Vipin yeah. is the uh, uh, MD of Ashok Leyland. Uh, he's the and uh, earlier was uh, the the MD of JCB, and he's an he's an old friend. <laughs> can awesome. you hear me, Noshin? Yeah, absolutely. We can hear you, Vipin. Okay, first. Uh, Congratulations to you and all your all the larger family of Forbes Marshall on Founders Day and to your dear father for a happy birthday. The question I have is that transition of leadership in institutions sometimes becomes a challenge. And just when you have a tall leader, an CI example, and then it went through a transition and now we have CB. Uh, for, for 11 years. But when leadership transition takes place, uh, Mr. Das, what are the learnings and what should people really be wary of to ensure that the transition is as smooth as possible? See, in an institution, unlike a company, uh, there are many more people involved in deciding on succession. And uh, if I look at my own uh, succession, the process started a few years ago before I was to step out. Um, but the President's Council, which was charged with this responsibility, um, had many voices. And of course, I was not there for most of the meetings. Occasionally I was called in for an input or for a response, but it's a very, very difficult process. And maybe eventually the few people who have the loudest voices, you know, dominate. Um, because other people may not be wanting to take them on in the meetings. So it's, it's difficult. Uh, there is this 
argument in favor of seniority. There's an argument in favor of merit. Uh, there's an argument in favor of youth. So there are different arguments. In the case of uh, my succession, uh, they went with seniority. And uh, it took a couple of director generals before we came to Chandrajit. And Chandrajit has now been there. I think he's in his uh, 13th year. 13th year now. So um, you've got stability back. You've got the organization now very steady, uh, at a, operating at a high level. Uh, and uh, I think, that, I guess the next transition will come as and when he is to retire. And maybe this time around, there will be a learning. In my case, it was the first time. People also learn from mistakes. Of course, the presidents, some of them will change. Some of them will still be around. But uh, they are the people who will decide. So, Vipin, in, in, you, have to re you have to reckon with ups and downs. This is life. You know? So... We, we, we all go through ups and downs. Institutions also go through ups and downs. It's part of the process. So sometimes boards will make mistakes. Sometimes they will do the right thing. They took, they, they did the right thing in selecting Chandrajit. He was 45 years old. Uh, plucked him out, saying, "We bet on this guy. We will not go for seniority." So. Thank you. Jay, question. Jay, I think you have a question. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Tarun. Um, so the question is, how do you deal with the challenge of propagating an inherently uh, strong and existing strong culture amongst all channels of a growing organization? Say both here in India, but also overseas. Um, say to a, a new recruit in, in an overseas territory like a Mexico or a Brazil, that um, inherently are very culturally different from us here as Indians. But how do you, you know, spread that very unique, strong culture um, within the organization all the way through to say someone um, like that? And, and especially relevant for a growing organization like ours. Thanks. I all, I've always felt that um, we have to bring those people to headquarters. We have to bring them to India and they have to see and experience what you are all about at home so that they imbibe you know, some of that in them. Right. But they come from a different culture. They speak a different language. Their history is different. They're different people. So there, there is no substitute for bringing them here. Uh, now, of course, with COVID and all that, it, it's another big challenge of bringing people physically here. But then they have to be, there has to be a lot of remote, remote uh, mm. training, as it were, or orientation uh, to not just to understand the business, but to understand the culture. Uh, and you're, you're, that's the, if they understand the culture, they'll be great for you. Actually, the business can follow, you know, because obviously they have some background of business, of some business, but the culture of Forbes Marshall, the culture of CII, that can only come from within. And so you have to have that personal connect. Somebody has to spend a lot of time on foreign people to, to induct them properly into the process. And it, it's not a one-off thing. It's going to be a process. Right. Thank you. Gigi, do you have, uh, would you like to ask your question or? <coughs> I don't know if you can unmute and ask. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Nashad. Uh, Mr. Das, uh, I think it's, I'm indeed fortunate to be a part of this event and to be listening to your very enlightening uh, talk on how to build great organizations. Uh, you have stated, and we have seen during this talk, your belief in honest answers. 
But many a situations, honest answers are not the best answers. So how have you dealt with such situations? Sometimes you keep quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you don't say anything. You wait, you wait your time. You take a, you know, you wait your time. Um, you wait for to see when that other person will be open to listening to you. And you may have to wait months. You know, we started pushing for liberalization in a very strong way from 1982. And it came in 1991, but we never gave up on it. And we found different language and different ways and different presentations and different speeches to keep coming back to the same message. And we kept getting pushed back. We kept getting pushed back. It was part of the game. This is India. Nothing is going to happen fast. So it's all the about total, having faith in your belief. Is that it? Not shaken our belief. We never, never changed. So we have to have an open economy. And by the way, in that, many of our industry people had reservations because they'd never had competition and they didn't want to face that competition. And I remember in a board meeting of CII, my very good friend Rahul Bajaj said to me in the board meeting, you will sell out the country. Don't liberalize India. We are not ready for this competition. He said that. And I said to Rahul that you underestimate yourself. And as you probably know, Bajaj Auto is the most profitable two-wheeler company in the world. Not in India, in the world. So I think many Indian entrepreneurs, Indian business leaders did not have that self-confidence because they grew up in a very protected environment. They never faced competition. And uh, we had an executive board meeting once. It's a smaller board, not the main board. And Ratan Tata and Rahul Bajaj were throwing things at each other. Ratan wanted that CII should continue to push for reform. And Rahul wanted that we should go, to, go slow. And reforms had to be slowed down. And Rajiv Kaul was the president. And it was very nasty in that small meeting room. And Rajiv turned to me and said, what do we do? I said, close the meeting. We deal with each of them separately. <laughs> and that's what we did. We, we dealt with them offline and we continued on our course of uh, pushing for reforms. So I'll, Thank ask, you, Mr. Das. I'll ask one more question from here and then I'm going to give the last question to Farhan. So, uh, so there's a question from uh, Jana Kinshirin. Uh, it says, how does an organization with your culture and ethos stay true to its course in the face of tremendous political pressure? which is in direct opposition to its governing principles and beliefs. Well, the chief custodian of CII and its culture is there and he should really answer it. I think the CII is doing a good job. Yeah, I think they're, they're doing a good job. They're managing uh, to, to deal, with, uh, deal with challenges. As I said, it's a much more difficult time now uh, than what I faced. But uh, I also faced, in, in the 70s were very bad in India. So I have seen those times. Uh, many of you may not have seen those times. Uh, so we are seeing very difficult times now, uh, made worse because of uh, COVID. But uh, as I say, this time will pass. We are living in this center of it, so we feel it more. We feel the pressure, we feel the negativism uh, deeply, but uh, this time will pass. Thanks, Tarun. Farad? Thank you very much, Tarun, for all your great insights. I have one, uh, one question related to the culture again, um, and how you preserve it going along. So, you know, you spoke about that when you, when we, when you started CII, um, focused on youth bringing in younger people 
I mean, you were younger yourself, but you also had young precedents at that time. And as the organization ages, the people in the organization also age. And it's sort of necessary to be able to see that and then find a way to bring in young people and young thinking. Because as we all age, you know, we tend to be surrounded by people who are in our age group. Sure. And I just wonder how you have dealt with it, dealt with this challenge. Um, and can you share any, any insights on that? You know, in a family business, as we are, you have generational transition, which takes yeah. place. And that's actually a good way for, for um, young ideas and young thinking to come in because the next generation brings in their own thinking and yeah. they bring in their own people. But in an institution like CII, it will be very insightful if you can share anything uh, on how you handle that issue. So we came, uh, Farad, we came to a very difficult uh, situation uh, in 1998. Um, we'd had great success from 1985 to 1998. But um, we were getting older. I was going to be 60 in 1999. I should have actually been retiring then. Uh, the board was not ready for it. Uh, people had aged. So we turned to an external group to help us. I turned to Boston Consulting Group and Arun Myra. Uh, Boston Consulting Group, Arun was a friend. We had been working together for a long time. And I said, you know, we're facing all kinds of problems now uh, coming up. So we've got to find, we've got to reinvent CII as it were. We actually, okay, it's been a great success story, but we need to reinvent. Uh, my colleagues, uh, some of them are very resistant. We know the answers. We know what to do. We don't need an outsider to tell us. But the greatness of Boston Consulting Group is that they work with you. They set up a four person team. One of them was Chandrajit, actually. One woman, three men, including the man who was most opposed to using external help. And from 1998 to 2004, we worked together for six years through a process to, and we kept on changing and reinventing bit by bit, bit by bit. So we went through a crisis for us. We went through our own difficulties. And at that point of time, I felt we needed some external help, but people who would not just come and give a report and go away, but people who would work with you side by side almost as members of the family. People in Boston Consulting Group were deeply committed to CII. So they, they did this side by side with us as part of the team. And I think what you're seeing today, the CII, which came later, uh, came out of a product of a combined effort of CII and BCG. Thank you. Thanks, Tarun. So, Tarun, Tar 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 you know, um, this, is, this has been wonderful, uh, really wonderful. Uh, it's been wonderful because, uh, not only because of all your many insights, but with, uh, because of the authenticity with which you've offered them as always. And uh, I think, you know, you, you talked about, about the heart being at the core of doing the right thing in an organization. Um, and I think uh, the heart was at the core of all your responses as well. And uh, that's what makes them so meaningful and so insightful and valuable to us all. So uh, I'll only say thank you so much for all your insights and all the time that you've spent with us. It's been deeply meaningful. 
to us all. Thank you, Naushad. Thank you very much. Very special for me. And I feel so much that uh, Forbes and Marshall and CII have so much in common. Uh, I think these are kind of different families, but families nevertheless, and with very, very similar shared values. But wonderful to be with you. Thank you. Thank you again, Tony. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'll